This is your promise tape on life, death, and life after death. I'm sharing with you some of the experiences and findings that we had during the last decade since we started to study the whole issue of death and life after death seriously. After working with dying patients for so many years, it became very evident that in spite of our existence of so many millions of years as human beings, we have not yet come to a clear understanding of perhaps the most important question, namely the one of the definition, meaning, and purpose of life and death. I wanted to share with you some of this research in death and life after death, and I think the time has come when we're all trying to put these findings together in a language that can help people to understand and also perhaps help them in dealing with the death of a loved one, especially the tragic occurrence of a sudden death when we don't quite understand why these tragedies have to happen to us. It is also very important when we try to counsel and help dying patients and their families, and the question occurs over and over again. What is life? What is death? And why do young children, especially young children, have to die? We have not published any of our research for many reasons. We have studied near-death experiences for decades, but we were very aware that those were near-death experiences and that we could not share half-truths until we also knew what would happen to those people after they made the transition. The only thing that Shanti Nilaya has published so far was a letter that I wrote and illustrated in response to a nine-year-old boy with cancer from the southern part of the United States and who wrote me a very moving question. What is life and what is death and why do young children have to die? I borrowed my daughter's colored felt pencils and printed him a little letter illustrating it and sent it off to him in a simple language that should be understood by any child from preschool age to early grade school age. His response was not only very positive, but needless to say, he was a very proud young man to have a special little picture book from me and shared it not only with his parents, but also with the parents of other dying children. As a special gift to me, he gave us permission to have it printed and make it available through Shantinilaya to help other young children to understand this most important question. If you are interested in obtaining such a copy, simply write to Shantinilaya and ask for the doggy letter. A long time ago, people were much more in touch with the issues of death and believed in a heaven or a life after death. It is only in the last hundred years, perhaps, that fewer and fewer people truly know that life exists after our physical body dies. There is no purpose to analyze at this time and point out why this has occurred. But we are now in a new age and hopefully have made the transition from an age of science and technology and materialism to a new age of genuine and authentic spirituality, which does not mean really religiosity, but spirituality, meaning an awareness that there is something far greater than we are, something that created this universe, created life, and that we are an authentic and important and significant part of it and can contribute to its evolution. All of us, when we were born from the source, from God, have been endowed with this facet of divinity. And that means in a very literal sense that we have a part of that source within us. And that gives us the knowledge of our immortality. And many people are beginning to be aware that the physical body is only the house or the temple, or as we call it, the cocoon, which we inhabit for a certain number of months or years until we make the transition called death. And then at the time of death, we shed this cocoon and we are again as free as a butterfly to use the symbolic language that we use when we talk to dying children and their siblings. I have worked with dying patients for the last 20 years 
And when I started this work, I must say that I was neither very interested in life after death, nor did I have any really clear picture about the definition of death, except naturally for those that the science of medicine has defined. When you study the definition of death, you see that it only includes the death of a physical body, as if man would only exist of the cocoon. I was one of those physicians, scientists, who did not ever question that. And I guess it only became a really relevant and very important issue in the 60s when a transplant of organs, especially of kidneys and hearts, raised an important question as to when are we ethically, morally and legally allowed to remove an organ out of a patient in order to save another person's life. <clears throat> it has also become a big legal issue in the last few decades since our materialism has reached a point where people, people sue each other, where the issue of prolongation of life has raised many, many difficult problems and where we can be sued for either attempting an organ too early out of a person when the family claims that they are still alive or when we wait too long and perhaps often prolong a life unnecessarily. The health insurance companies have also added to this problem in that in a family accident, it is sometimes of vital importance to know who in the family died before, even if it is only a matter of minutes. Again, the issue is money and who the beneficiaries would be. Needless to say, all these issues touched me very little had it not been for my own very subjective experiences at the bedside of my own dying patients. Being a skeptical, semi-believer, to put it mildly, and not interested in issues of life after death. I could not help but be impressed by several observations which occurred so frequently that I began to wonder why nobody ever studied the real issues of death, not for any special scientific reasons, not for any reasons to cover lawsuits, needless to say, but simply out of sheer natural curiosity. Man has existed for 47 million years and has been in its present existence, which includes the facet of divinity for seven million years in its present form. And every day people die all over the world. And yet in a society that is able to bring a man to the moon and bring him back well and safe, we have never put any efforts into the study of an updated and total definition of human death. Isn't that peculiar? So in the midst of my caring for dying patients and teaching medical and seminary students, we decided one day on the spur of the moment that we would try to come up with a new and updated and all-inclusive definition of death. It is said somewhere, ask and you will be given, knock and the door will be opened, or in a different language, a teacher will appear when the student is ready. This proved to be very true, as within one week, after raising this important question and making a commitment to finding an answer to this question, we were visited by nurses who shared with us the experience of a woman who had been in the intensive care unit 15 times. Each time this woman was expected to die, and yet each time she was able to walk out of the intensive care unit to live for another few weeks or another few months. She was, as we would call it now, our first case that we had of a near-death experience. This occurred simultaneously with my increasing sensitivity and observation of other unexplained phenomena at the time when my own patients were very, very close to death. Many of them began to, quote, hallucinate, unquote, the presence of loved ones with which they apparently had some form of communication, but who I personally was neither able to see nor hear. I was also quite aware that even the angriest and the most difficult patients, very shortly before death, began to deeply relax, have a sense of serenity around them. 
and were pain-free in spite of perhaps a cancer-ridden body full of metastasis. Also, the moment after death occurred, their facial features expressed an incredible sense of peace and equanimity and serenity, which I could not comprehend, since it was often a death that occurred in a stage of anger, bargaining, or depression. My third, and perhaps most subjective, observation was the fact that I had always been very close to my patients and allowed myself to get deeply and lovingly involved with them. They touched my life and I touched their lives in a very intimate, meaningful way. Yet within minutes after their death, I had no feelings for these patients and often wondered if there was something wrong with me. When I looked at them, it appeared to me similar to a winter coat that we shed with the occurrence of spring, knowing that we don't need it anymore. I had this incredible, clear image of a shell, and my beloved patient was no longer in that bed. Naturally, as a scientist, I could not explain that and had a tendency to put these observations aside. If it had not been for Mrs. Schwartz, her husband was a known schizophrenic, and each time he had a psychotic episode, he tried to kill this youngest son, the youngest of many children, and the only one still at home. It was the patient's conviction that if she should die prematurely, her husband would lose control and the life of her youngest son would be in danger. Through the help of the Legal Aid Society, we were able to make arrangements for her to transfer the custody of this child to some relatives. And she left the hospital with a great sense of relief and a new freedom, knowing that should she not be able to live long enough, that at least her youngest child was now safe too. It was this very patient who almost a year later returned to our hospital and shared with us our first near-death experience. Experiences that have been published in the last few years in many books and magazines and who have become familiar to the general public. Mrs. Schwartz shared her experience of having been hospitalized on an emergency basis in a local hospital in Indiana at the time when she was too sick to be transferred all the way to Chicago. She remembers having been admitted in very critical condition, being put into a private room in the hospital, and just as she was contemplating whether she should struggle once more for the sake of her youngest child, or simply let go, lean back in a pillow, and shed her cocoon, she became aware of a nurse who walked into the room, took one look at her and dashed out. At this very moment, she saw herself slowly and peacefully floating out of her physical body and floating a few feet above her bed. She even had a great sense of humor relating that she looked at her body, which looked pale and icky. She had a sense of awe and surprise, but no fear or anxiety. She then watched the resuscitation team walk into the room, enumerated in great details who walked in first, who walked in last, was totally aware of not only every word of their conversations, but also of their thought patterns, and had only one great need, namely to convey to them to relax, to take it easy, and to tell them that she was all right. But the more desperately she tried to convey this to them, the more frantically they seemed to work on her body, until it dawned on her that she was able to perceive them, but they were not able to perceive her. Mrs. Schwartz then decided to give up her attempts, and in her own language she said, I lost consciousness. She was declared dead after a 45-minute unsuccessful resuscitation attempt and later on showed signs of life again, much to the surprise of the hospital staff, and lived another year and a half. 
Then Mrs. Schwartz shared this with my class and myself in our seminars. Needless to say, it was a brand new experience for me. I had never heard of near-death experiences in spite of the fact that I had been a physician for many years. My students were shocked that I did not call this a hallucination, an illusion, or a feeling of depersonalization. They had a desperate need to give it a label, something that they could identify with and then put it aside and not having to deal with it. Mrs. Schwartz's experience, we were sure, could not be a single unique occurrence. Our hope was to be able to find more cases like this and perhaps go in the direction of collection of data to see if this was a common, a rare or a very unique experience that this patient had. Needless to say, and it has become known now all over the world, that many, many researchers, physicians, psychologists, and people who study parapsychological phenomena have tried to collect cases like this. And in the last 10 years, over 25,000 cases have been collected from all over the world. It may be simplest to summarize what all these people experience at the moment of cessation of physical bodily functioning. We call this simply near-death experiences, as all these patients have made a comeback and were able to share with us after they recovered. We will talk later on on what happens to those people who do not make a comeback. It is important to understand that of the many people who have cardiac arrests or who are resuscitated, only one out of 10 has a conscious recollection of the experiences they had during this temporary cessation of vital functionings. This is very understandable if we compare it with the average population, all of whom dream every night, but only a small percentage of the people are aware of their dreams on awakening. The cases we collected throughout not only the United States, but Australia, Canada. The youngest is a two-year-old child, the oldest a 97-year-old man. We have people from different cultural and religious backgrounds, including Eskimos, original Hawaiians, aboriginals from Australia, Hindus, Buddhists, Protestants, Catholic Jews, and several people without any religious identification including a few who call themselves agnostics or atheists. It was important for us to collect data from the greatest possible variety of people from different religious and cultural backgrounds, as we wanted to be very sure not only that our material was not contaminated, but it was a uniquely human experience and had nothing to do with early religious or other conditioning. We can say, after all these years of collecting data, that the following points are common denominators in all the people who have had these near-death experiences. Also irrelevant is the fact that they had these experiences after an accident, murder attempt, suicide attempt, or a slow lingering death. Over half of our cases have been sudden death experiences, and therefore the patients would not have been able to prepare or anticipate an experience. At the moment of death, all of you who are listening to this tape will experience the separation of the real immortal you from the temporary house, namely the physical body. We will call this immortal self the soul or the entity, or using the symbolic language that we use when we communicate with children we call it the butterfly in the process of leaving the cocoon. When we leave the physical body, there will be a total absence of panic, fear, or anxiety. We will always experience a physical wholeness. We will be totally aware of the environment in which this accident or death occurs, whether this is a hospital room, whether this is our own bedroom after we experience a coronary at home, or whether this is after a tragic car accident or a plane crash. 
You will be quite aware of the people who work in the resuscitation team or the people who try to work in a rescue attempt, trying to extricate perhaps a mutilated and hurt body out of a car wreck. We will watch this at the distance of a few feet in a rather detached state of mind, if I may use the word mind, so we are no longer connected with the mind or a functioning brain at this moment in most cases. This all occurs at the time when we have no brainwave tests that are still giving us signs of brain activities. It happens very often at the time when physicians find no signs of life whatsoever. At this moment of observation of the scene of death, we will be aware of people's conversations, their behaviors, their attires, their thoughts, without having any negative effect about the whole occurrence. Our second body, which we experience at this time, is not the physical body, but is an ethereal body. And we will talk later on about the differences between physical, psychic, and spiritual energy which create this form. In this second, temporary, ethereal body, we experience a total wholeness, as I said before. Namely, if we have been amputees, we will have our legs again. If we have been deaf mutes, we can hear and talk and sing. If we have been a multiple sclerosis patient in a wheelchair with blurred vision, blurred speech, and unable to move our legs, we are able to sing and dance again. It is understandable that many of our patients who have been successfully resuscitated are not always grateful when their butterfly is squashed back into a cocoon. Since with the revival of our bodily functions, we also have to accept the pains and the handicaps that go with it. In the state of the ethereal body, we have no pain and no handicaps. Many of my colleagues wondered if this is not simply a projection of our wishful thinking, which could be very understandable and comprehensible. If anyone has been paralyzed, mute, blind, or handicapped for many, many years. They may be looking forward to a time when their suffering is ended. It is very easy to evaluate whether this is a projection of visual thinking or not. Number one, half of our cases have been sudden, unexpected accidents or near-death experiences where people were unable to foresee what was going to hit them, like in the case of a hit and run driver who amputated the legs of one of our patients. And yet, when he was out of his physical body, he saw his amputated leg on the highway and was fully aware of having both of his legs on his ethereal, perfect and whole body. So we cannot assume that they had previous knowledge of the loss of their legs and would therefore project in their own wishful thinking that they were able to walk again. But there is a much simpler way to rule out the projection of wishful thinking, and that is to use blind people who do not have light perception. We ask them to share with us what it was like when they had this near-death experience. If it was just a dream fulfillment, those people would not be able to share with us the color of a sweater we wear, the design of a tie, or minute details of shape, colors, and designs of the people's clothing. We have questioned several totally blind people who were able to share with us in their near-death experience, and they were not only able to tell us who came into the room first, who worked on the resuscitation, but they were able to give minute details of the attire and the clothing of all the people present, something a totally blind person would never be able to do. Besides the absence of pain and the experience of a physical wholeness in a simulated perfect body, we may call the ethereal body, people will also be aware that it is impossible to die alone. And there are three reasons why no one can die alone. And by no one, I mean people who would even die in a desert of thirst a few hundred miles away from the next human being, or an astronaut who would be sent in a capsule alone into the universe and would miss the target and would circle around the universe until they die of natural causes. 
When we are slowly preparing for death, as is often the case with children who have cancer, prior to death, many of these children begin to be aware that they have the ability to leave their physical body and have what we call an out-of-body experience. All of us have these out-of-body experiences during certain states of sleep. Very few of us are consciously aware of it. Dying children especially, who are much more tuned in and become much more spiritual than healthy children of the same age, become aware of these short trips out of their physical body, which help them in the transition, which help them to familiarize themselves with the place where they are in the process of going. It is during those out-of-body trips with dying patients, young and old, experience that they become aware of the presence of beings who surround them, who guide them and who help them. Young children often refer to them as their playmates. The churches have called them guardian angels. Most researchers would call them guides. It is not important what label we give them, but it is important that we know that every single human being, from the moment of birth, which begins with the taking of the first breath, until the moment when we make the transition and end this physical existence, that we are in the presence of these guides or guardian angels who will wait for us and help us in the transition from life to life after death. Also, we will always be met by those who preceded us in death and whom we have loved. Like the child we have lost, maybe decades earlier, a grandmother, a father, a mother, or other people who have been significant in our lives. The third reason why we cannot die alone is that when we shed our physical bodies, even temporarily, prior to death, we are in an existence where there is no time and no space. And in this existence, we can be anywhere we choose to be at the speed of our thought. A little Susie, who is dying of leukemia in a hospital, may be attended by her mother for weeks and weeks, and it becomes very clear to the dying child that it becomes increasingly difficult for her to leave mommy, who leans perhaps over the aluminum side rails, and sometimes implicitly or explicitly conveys, honey, don't die on me, I can't live without you. So what we are doing to these patients, naturally, is to make them, in a sense, guilty for dying on us. So Susie, who has become more and more tuned in with total life, with the awareness of her existence after death and the full awareness of a continuation of life, a Susie who has, during the night and during an altered state of consciousness, been out of the body and has become aware of her ability to travel and to literally fly anywhere she wants to be. They'll simply ask mommy to leave the hospital. Often children say, mommy, you look so tired. Why don't you go home, take a shower, take a rest? I'm really okay now. And the mother leaves, and half an hour later, a nurse may call from the hospital and say, I'm sorry, Mrs. Smith, your daughter just passed away. Unfortunately, those parents will often live with a tremendous amount of guilt and shame and reprimand themselves for not having stuck it out just another half a day when they would have been with their child at the moment of death. Little do they understand and comprehend that no one can die alone. Because the Susie, unburdened by her own needs, is able to let go of the cocoon and free herself quite quickly, she will then, at the speed of her thought, be with mommy or daddy or whoever she needs to be with. We have been all endowed by a facet of divinity, as we mentioned earlier. We have received this gift seven million years ago, and that includes not only the ability to have free choice, but also the ability to shed our physical body, not only at the time of death, but in times of crisis, in times of exhaustion, in times of very extraordinary circumstances, and also in a certain type of sleep. It is important that we know that this happens before death. Viktor Frankl, who wrote the very beautiful book, The Search for Meaning, of his experiences in the concentration camps, 
was probably one of the best known scientists who studied out of good experiences many decades ago when it was not yet popular. He studied people who fell from the mountains in Europe and who experienced a review of their life. He studied how many of these life experiences went through their mind during the very brief period, maybe a few seconds of a fall from a high mountain and became aware that during these out-of-body experiences, time cannot possibly exist. Many people have had similar experiences when they had a near drowning or during a time of their life when they were in great danger. Our study was verified by laboratory research with the collaboration of Bob Monroe, who wrote the book Journeys Out of the Body. I have had not only spontaneous out-of-body experiences, but have had those that were induced in a laboratory, supervised by Monroe, and watched and observed and shared by several scientists from the Menninger Foundation in Topeka. More and more scientists and researchers are repeating these kind of studies now and have found it to be quite verifiable and naturally it lends itself to a great many aspects of a study of a dimension which is very hard to conceive with our three-dimensional scientific approach to life. We have also been questioned about the guides or guardian angels, about the presence of loving human beings, especially deceased members of our family who preceded us in death and who come and welcome us at the time of our own transition. Again, the question comes up naturally. How do you verify such frequent occurrences in a more scientific way? It is interesting to me as a psychiatrist that thousands of people all around the globe should share the same hallucinations prior to death, namely the awareness of some relatives or friends who preceded them in death. There must be some explanation for this, if this is not real. And so we proceeded to trying to find out means and ways to study this, to verify this, or perhaps to verify that this is simply a projection of wishful thinking. The best way perhaps to study it is for us to sit with dying children after family accidents. We usually did this after 4th of July, weekends, Memorial Days, Labor Days, when families go out together in family cars and all too often have head-on collisions which kills several members of the family and brings many of the injured survivors into different hospitals. I have made it a task to sit with the critically injured children since they are my specialty and being quite aware that they have not been informed about the number and names of the relatives who have been killed was very impressed that they were always aware of those who preceded them in death. I sit with them, watch them silently, perhaps hold their hand watch their restlessness, and then often, shortly prior to death, a peaceful serenity, which is always a nominous sign. It is at this time that I ask them if they are willing and able to share with me what they experience. They share in very similar words, quote, everything is all right now, Mommy and Peter are already waiting for me, unquote. I am aware that her mother was killed suddenly at the scene of the accident, but I'm not aware that her brother Peter also died. Shortly afterwards, I received a phone call from the children's hospital that Peter had died 10 minutes ago. In all the many years that we have collected this kind of data, we have never met a child who in the imminence of their own death mentioned a person in their family that had not preceded them in death, even if it was only by a few minutes. I do not know how to explain this any other way, except from the knowledge 
that these people are already aware of the presence of their family members who will wait for them for the time of their own transition when they are reunited again in a different form of life that many people do not really yet comprehend. Another experience perhaps moved me even more than the children. And that was the case of an American Indian of whom we have very little data up to date since American Indians do not often talk about issues of death and dying. This young American Indian woman was hit by a hit and run driver on a highway when a stranger stopped his car in an attempt to help her. She very calmly told him that there was nothing else that he could do for her except perhaps one day he might get near the Indian reservation where her mother lived, about 700 miles away from the scene of the accident. She had a message for her mother and maybe one day he would be able to convey this message to her. The message stated that she was okay, that she was not only okay, but that she was very happy because she was already with her dad. She then died in the arms of the stranger who was so touched that he was at the right time at the right place that he drove 700 miles out of his way to visit the mother in the Indian reservation only to be told that her mate, the victim's father, had died one hour prior to the accident of a coronary at the Indian reservation 700 miles apart. We have many, many cases like this where the people who were in the process of dying had not been informed or aware of the death of a family member and yet were greeted by them. We became aware that our job was not to convince or to convert others of the fact that death does not exist, but that our job was simply one of sharing. If you are ready to hear it and willing to have an open mind, you will get and find your own experiences. They are very easy to have if you ask for it. In every audience of 800 people, there are at least 12 authentic, genuine cases of people who have had such an experience and who are willing to share it with you if you have an open mind and you are not critical, negative, judgmental and have no need to label it with a psychiatric label. The only thing that prevents them from sharing it with others in our society is our incredible tendency to label, to belittle, or to deny such stories when they make us uncomfortable and don't fit into our own scientific or religious model. All the experiences I have shared so far will be the experiences you have when you are in a critical condition or near death. Needless to say, all the people who shared those experiences with us have been people who made a comeback and were able to share it with us. My most dramatic and unforgettable case of ask and you will be given and also of a near-death experience was a man who was in the process of being picked up by his entire family for a Memorial Day weekend drive to some relatives out of town. During the traveling to the place of work where he was supposed to be picked up by his parents, in-laws, wife and eight children, the family van was hit by a gasoline tank. The gasoline poured over the car and burned his entire family to death. He remained in a state of total shock and numbness for several weeks stopped working, was unable to communicate, and to make a long story short, became a total bum, drinking a half a gallon of whiskey a day, trying heroin and other drugs to numb his pain, was unable to hold a job for any length of time, and ended up literally in the gutter. It was during one of my hectic traveling tours and having just finished the second lecture in the day on life after death when a hospice group in Santa Barbara asked me for yet another lecture. 
After my preliminary statements, I became aware that I'm very tired of repeating the same stories over and over again. And I quietly said to myself, Oh God, why don't you send me somebody from the audience who has had such a near-death experience and who is willing to share it with the audience so I can take a break and they have a first-hand experience instead of hearing my old stories over and over again. At that very moment, the organizer of the group gave me a little slip of paper with an urgent message on it, a message from a man from the Bowery who begged me to share with me his near-death experiences. I took a little break and sent the messenger to this Bowery hotel, and a few moments later, after a speedy cab ride, the man appeared in the audience, and instead of being an expected bum, as he described himself, it was a rather well-dressed, very sophisticated man who went up on the stage and without having a need to evaluate him, I encouraged him to share with the audience what he needed to share. He shared how he was looking forward to the weekend family reunion, how his entire family piled into a huge family van and they were on the way to pick him up when this tragic accident occurred which burned his entire family to death. He shared the shock and the numbness, the utter disbelief to being suddenly a single man, of having had children and suddenly becoming childless, of living without a single close relative in one instant of a tragic accident and his total inability to come to grips with it. He shared how he became from a money-earning, decent, middle-class husband and father, a total bum, drunk every day from morning till night, using every conceivable drug and trying to commit suicide in every conceivable way and yet never able to succeed. His last recollection was after two years of literally bumming around, lying on the edge of a forest in a dirt road, drunk and stoned, as he called it, again desperately trying to be reunited with his family, not wanting to live not having the energy to even move out of the road when he saw a big truck coming down the street and literally running over him. It was at this moment that he watched himself in the street, critically injured, while he observed the whole scene of the accident a few feet from above, as he called it. It was at this moment that his family appeared in front of him, in a glow of light, with an incredible sense of love and happy smiles on their faces, simply making him aware of their presence, not communicating in any verbal way, but in a form of a thought transference, sharing with him the joy and the happiness of their present existence. This man was not able to tell us how long this reunion took place, but he was so awed by their health, by their beauty, by their radiance, by their total accepting of his present life situation, by their unconditional love, that he made a vow not to touch them, not to join them, but to re-enter his physical body and to promise that he would share with the world what he had experienced in a form of redemption for his two years of trying to throw his physical life away. It was after this vow that he watched how the truck driver carried his totally injured body into the car, how an ambulance was speeding up to the scene of the accident, how he was taken to the hospital emergency room and strapped down on a stretcher. And it was in the emergency room that he finally re-entered his physical body, tore off the 
straps that were tied around him and walked literally out of the emergency room without ever having any delirium tremens or any after effect from the heavy abuse of drugs and alcohol. He felt healed and whole and made a commitment that he would not die until he had the opportunity of sharing the existence of life after death with as many people as would be willing to hear him. It was after reading a newspaper article about my appearance in Santa Barbara that he sent a message to the auditorium, and by my allowing him to share it with the audience, he was able to keep the promise he made at the time of his short and temporary and happy reunion with his entire family. We do not know what happened to this man since then, but I will never forget the glow in his eyes, the joy and the deep gratitude he experienced that he was led to a place where, without doubt and questioning, he was allowed to stand up on a stage and share with a group of hundreds of hospice workers the total knowledge and awareness that our physical body is only the shell that encloses our immortal self. The question naturally comes, what happens then after death? We have studied very young children who have not yet read Moody's book and have not had an opportunity to reading magazine articles or listening to accounts of others like this man. And even our youngest patient, the two-year-old child, was able to share with us what he experienced and called the moment of death. The only religious differences between people from different religious backgrounds is the presence of certain religious figures. And the two-year-old is perhaps our best example. He had an anaphylactic, allergic reaction to a drug given to him by a physician in a doctor's office and was declared dead. And while the physician and the mother waited for the arrival of the father, the mother desperately touched her little boy, cried and sobbed and pleaded with him. After what seemed to her eternity, her little two-year-old opened his eyes and said in a voice of an old wise man, Mommy, I was dead. I was in the most beautiful place, and I didn't want to come back. I was with Jesus and with Mary. And Mary kept telling me that my time was not right, I had to go back. But I tried to ignore her. And when she realized that I tried to ignore her, she pulled me gently by the wrist and took me away from Jesus and said, You have to go back, Peter. You have to save your mommy from the fire. It was at this moment that Peter opened his eyes and he said with a happy voice, you know, mommy, when she told me that, I ran all the way back home. This mother was not able to share this incident for 13 years and was rather depressed because of the misinterpretation of Mary's statement to her son, Peter. Her misunderstanding was that her son was eventually the one who had to save her from the fire, from hell. And she couldn't understand why she was supposed to be doomed for hell, as she was a very decent, hard-working woman of faith. I tried to convey to her that she did not understand the symbolic language, that this was a unique and beautiful gift of Mary, who is, like all beings, in the spiritual realm, a being of total and unconditional love, unable to condemn or to criticize a quality that only human beings have. I asked her for a moment to stop thinking and to simply allow her own spiritual intuitive quadrant to respond. And I asked her, what would it have been if Mary would not have sent Peter back to you 13 years ago? She grabbed her hair and she shouted out, Oh, my God, I would have gone through hell and fire. Needless to say, it was no longer important to say, Now do you understand that Mary saved you from the fire? The scriptures are full of examples of the symbolic language. 
and if people would listen more to their own intuitive spiritual quadrant and not contaminate the understanding of these beautiful messages with their own negativity, their own fears, their own guilt, their own needs to punish others or themselves, they would begin to comprehend the beautiful symbolic language that dying patients use when they try to convey to us their needs, their knowledge, and their awareness. Needless to say, a Jewish child would not likely be able to see Jesus. A Protestant child would not likely to see Mary. Not that they would not care for those children, but simply because we always get what we need the most. The ones we meet are the ones we have loved the most and who preceded us in death. After we are met by those we have loved, after we are met by our own guides and guardian angels, we are passing through a symbolic transition, often described in the form of a tunnel. Some people experience it as a river, some as a gate, but each one will choose what is most symbolically appropriate for them. In my own personal experience, it was naturally a mountain path with wildflowers, simply because my concept of heaven includes mountains and wildflowers, the source of much happiness in my childhood in Switzerland. This is culturally determined. After we pass through this visually very beautiful and individually appropriate form of transition, say the tunnel, we are approaching a source of light that many of our patients describe and that I have myself experienced in the form of an incredibly beautiful and unforgettable life-changing experience called cosmic consciousness. In the presence of this light, which most people in our Western Hemisphere call Christ or God or love or light, we are surrounded by total and absolute unconditional love, understanding and compassion. It is in the presence of this light, which is a source of pure spiritual energy and no longer physical or psychic energy. Spiritual energy can neither be manipulated nor used by human beings. It is an energy in the realm of existence where negativity is impossible. And that means that no matter how bad we have been in our life or how guilty we feel, we are unable to experience any negative emotions. It is also totally impossible to be condemned in this presence, which many people call Christ or God, since he is a being of total and absolute unconditional love. It is in this presence where we become aware of our potential of what we could be like, of what we could have lived like. It is also in this presence, surrounded by compassion, love, and understanding, that we are asked to review and evaluate our total existence. Since we are no longer attached to a mind or physical brain and a limiting physical body, we have all knowledge and all understanding it is in this existence that we have to review and evaluate every thought, every word, and every deed of our existence. And we will be simultaneously aware of how all of these have affected others. In the presence of the spiritual energy, we no longer have the need for a physical form. And we then leave this ethereal, simulated body behind and resume again the form that we had before we were born and the form we will have in eternity between lifetimes and the form we will have when we merge with the source, with God, when we have finished our destiny. It is important to understand that from the moment of our existence until we return to God, that we always maintain our own identity and our own energy pattern. And that in the billions of people in this universe, on this physical plane, and in the unobstructed world, there are no two energy patterns 
no two people alike, not even identical twins. If anybody doubts in the greatness of our Creator, one should consider what genius it takes to create billions of energy patterns, and no two are alike. This is the uniqueness of the human being, and the only way I could compare this miracle with are the number of snowflakes on this planet Earth, and knowing that there are no two snowflakes alike. I have had the great blessing of being able to see with my own physical eyes the presence of hundreds of those energy patterns in full daylight, and it is very similar to a fluttering, pulsating series of different snowflakes, all with their different lights, their different colors, and their different forms and shapes. This is what we are like after we die. This is also how we exist before we are born. It takes up no space no time to go literally from one star to another, from planet Earth to another galaxy. And those energy patterns, those beings, are with us right here. And if we only had the eyes to see it, we would be aware that we are never, ever alone. And that we are surrounded by these beings who guide us, who love us, who protect us, who try to direct us to help us to go on the track where we have to be to fulfill our own destiny. Maybe in times of great pain, of great sorrow, and great loneliness, we can get tuned in and become aware of their presence. We can communicate with them at night before we fall asleep, and we can ask them to make their presence known to us. We can ask them questions before we are asleep, and we can ask them to give us an answer in our dreams. Those who have been tuned in to their sleep state, to their dreams, become aware that many of our questions are answered in this state. And as we get more tuned in to our own inner entity, to our own inner spiritual part, it is very understandable that we can get help and guidance also from our own inner entity, from our own all-knowing self, that immortal part we call the butterfly. Let me share with you now some of my own mystical experiences that helped me truly know rather than believe that all these existences beyond the realm of our scientific understanding are true, are reality are something that is available to all human beings. I have to make it very clear that in my earlier years, I had no comprehension of higher consciousness. I never had a guru. In fact, I was never really able to meditate, a source of great peace and understanding for many people, not only in the Eastern Hemisphere, but more and more of the Western world. It is true that I'm getting totally tuned in when I communicate with dying patients, and maybe in those thousands of hours that I've been sitting with them, where nothing and no one was able to distract us, that this may be considered a form of meditation. If that is true, then I have indeed meditated for many, many hours. But I truly believe that it is not important to go to a mountaintop, to live as a hermit, to go to India, or to have a guru, to have these mystical experiences. I truly believe that every human being consists of a physical, an emotional, an intellectual, and a spiritual quadrant. And if we can learn to externalize our unnatural feelings, our unnatural emotions, our hate, our anguish, our unresolved griefs, our oceans of unshed tears that we can get back tuned into what we usually were meant to be. And that is a human being consisting of four quadrants all of which work together in total harmony and wholeness. 
It is only if we have learned to accept our physicalness, if we love and accept our physical body, if we are able to share our natural emotions without being handicapped by them, without being belittled when we cry, when we express natural anger, when we are jealous in order to emulate someone else's talents, gifts, or behavior, when we are able to understand that we have only two natural fears, one of falling and one of loud noises, and that all the other fears have been given to us by grown-ups who projected their own fears onto us and passed them on from generation to generation. And most important of all, if we have learned to love and be loved unconditionally. Most of us have been raised as prostitutes. I love you if, and this word if, has ruined and destroyed more lives than anything else on this planet Earth. It prostitutes us. It makes us feel that we can buy love with good behavior or good grades, and we will never develop a sense of self-love and self-worth. Also, if we have not been able to accommodate the grown-ups, we have been punished rather than to be taught by consistent, loving discipline instead of punishment. As our teachers taught us, if you had been raised with unconditional love and discipline, you would never be afraid of the windstorms of life. You would have no fear, no guilt, no anxieties. The only enemies of man. Should you shield the canyons from the windstorms, you would never see the beauty of their carvings. And so I went about not looking for a guru, not trying to meditate, not trying to reach any states of higher consciousness, but each time a patient or a life situation made me aware of some negativity within me, I tried to externalize it so I would eventually reach that harmony between my physical, emotional, spiritual and intellectual quadrant. And as I did my homework and tried to practice what I go around teaching, I was blessed with more and more mystical experiences, which means both a getting in touch with my own intuitive spiritual, all-knowing and all-understanding self, but I was also able to get in touch with the guidance which comes from the unobstructed world and which always surrounds us and waits for an occasion, an opportunity to not only impinge on us knowledge and directions, but also helps us to understand what life and especially our own personal destiny is all about, so that we can fulfill our destiny in one lifetime and do not have to return in order to learn the lessons we have not been able to pass in this existence. One of my first experiences was during a research project where I was allowed to experience out-of-body experiences induced by iatrogenic means in a laboratory in Virginia and observed and attended by several skeptical scientists. It was during one of these out-of-body experiences that I was slowed down by the laboratory chief who felt that I went too fast and too soon. Much to my dismay, he in a way interfered with my own needs and my own personality. On a second attempt of having an out-of-body experience, I was determined to circumvent this problem by giving myself a self-induction to go faster than the speed of light and further than any human being has ever gone in an out-of-body experience. The moment the induction was given, I literally left my body in an incredible speed, and the only memory I had when I returned into my physical body 
was the words Shantinilaya. I had no idea about the meaning and significance of this word and literally had no concept of where I had been. The only awareness I had was that I was healed of an almost complete bowel obstruction and also of a very painful slipped disc which made it impossible for me to even pick up a book from the floor. When I came out of this experiment, my bowel obstruction was healed and I was literally able to lift a hundred pound sugar bag from the floor without any discomfort and pain. I was told that I radiated, that I looked 20 years younger and everybody present tried to press me for information. I had no idea where I was until the night after the experiment, a night I spent in a lonely guest house alone in the forest in the Blue Ridge Mountains, when gradually and not without trepidation, the awareness came to me that I had gone too far and that I had now to accept the consequences of my own choices. I tried to fight my sleep during that night, having a vague and inner knowledge that it would happen, not knowing what it would mean. And the moment I let go, I had probably the most painful, most agonizing experience any human being can ever live through. I literally lived through a thousand deaths of my thousand patients that I had attended by then. It was a total physical, spiritual, emotional, and intellectual agony with inability to breathe, with a doubling up of my body in agonizing physical pain and the total knowledge and awareness that I was out of reach of any human being and I had to make it somehow through that night. In these agonizing hours, I had only three reprieves. It was very similar to going through labor pain, and after each labor pain, another one follows immediately without having an instant to breathe in between. In those three brief moments where I was able to catch a breath, some significant symbolic occurrences happened which I understood only much later on. During the first reprieve, I begged for a shoulder to lean on, and I literally expected a man's left shoulder to appear, and I could put my head on his shoulder and bear the agony somewhat better. In the same instant that I asked for the shoulder to lean on, a deep, caring, compassionate, but severe voice simply stated, you shall not be given. Endless time later, I had another moment to catch a breath, and this time I begged for a hand to hold. And I again expected a hand to show up at the right side of my bed so I could grab onto it and endure the agony somewhat easier. And the same voice appeared again, you shall not be given. The third and the last time I was able to catch a breath, I contemplated to ask for a fingertip, and very much in character with myself. I said, no, if I can't get a single hand, I don't want a fingertip either. The meaning of the fingertip was naturally simply the awareness of the presence of a human being, with the full knowledge that I could not hold on to that fingertip. It became then for the first time in my life an issue of faith. And the faith had something to do with the deep inner knowledge that I had the strength and the courage to endure this agony all by myself. But it also included the faith and the knowledge that we are never given more than we can bear. I suddenly became aware that all I needed to do is to stop my fight, to stop my rebellion, to stop being a warrior, 
and to move from a rebellion to a simple, peaceful, positive submission, to an ability to simply say yes to it. And the moment I did that, the agony stopped. My breathing was easier. My physical pain disappeared. With the moment I uttered the word yes, not in words, but in thoughts. And instead of the thousand deaths, I lived through a rebirth experience, which is beyond any human description. It started with a very fast, vibration or pulsation of my abdominal wall which spread through my entire body and then spread onto anything that my eyes touched. The ceiling, the wall, the floors, the furniture, the bed, the window, the horizons outside of my window, the trees, and eventually included the whole planet Earth. It was as if the whole planet Earth was in a very high, speedy vibration. Every molecule vibrated. And at the same time, in front of me appeared something that looked like a lotus flower bud, which opened into an incredibly beautiful, colorful flower. And behind the lotus flower, appeared the light that my patients so often talked about. And as I approached this light through the open lotus flower, with the world in a deep, fast vibration, I gradually and slowly merged into this incredible, unconditional love, into this light, and I became one with it. At the moment of the merging into this source of light, all vibration stopped. A deep silence came over me, and I fell into a deep trance-like sleep, from which I awoke knowing that I had to wear a robe and put my sandals on and walk down the hill, and that it would occur at the moment when the sun would rise behind the horizon. Approximately an hour and a half later, I woke up, put the robe on, wore my sandals, and walked down the hill, and experienced probably the greatest ecstasy of existence that human beings can ever experience on this physical plane. I was in total love and awe of all life around me. I was in love with every leaf, every cloud, every grass, every living creature. I felt the pulsation of the pebbles on the path. And I literally walked above the pebbles, conveying to them, I cannot step on you, I cannot hurt you. As I reached the bottom of the hill, I became aware that I had not touched the ground on this path, but there was no questioning about the validity of the experience, simply an awareness of a cosmic consciousness of life in every living thing and of a love that can never, ever be described in words. It took me several days to come back to a physical existence with trivialities of washing dishes, doing the laundry, cooking a meal for my family. And it took several months before I was able to verbalize my experience and share it with a beautiful, non-judgmental, understanding group, a group who invited me to speak in a conference on transpersonal psychology in Berkeley, California. After I shared my experience, I was given a label for it. It was called Cosmic Consciousness. And as usual, I had to go to the library, find a book with the same title, do 
to learn intellectually and to comprehend the meaning of such a state. I was also told at that moment that the word that was given to me as I merged into the spiritual energy, the source of all light, that Shanti Nilaya means the final home of peace, the home where all of us will return to when we have gone through all the agonies, the pains, the sorrows, the griefs, and we are able to let go of the pain and become what we were created to be, a being of harmony between the physical, the emotional, the intellectual, and the spiritual quadrant, a being that understands that love, true love, has no claims and no ifs, and that if we could understand this state of love, that all of us would be whole and healthy, and all of us would be able to fulfill our destiny in one single lifetime. This experience has touched and changed my life in ways that are very difficult to put into words. But I think it was because of this experience that I also understood that if I would ever to share my understanding of life after death, that I would literally have to go for a thousand deaths, that the society in which I live would try to shred me to pieces. But the experience and the knowledge, the joy, the love, and the sensation of what followed the agony, the rewards would always be far greater than the pain.